Welcome to Incredible Idaho. I'm Jack Hemingway. This is a special show, a journey through the seasons, featuring the best of our incredible Idaho stories. We begin, appropriately enough, with spring, a season made for beginnings. In the wildlife world, spring is a very special time. It's a time of renewal for those animals that survive the winter. Nature has begun to loosen its icy grip and the fresh waters of spring have begun to flow. Water. It nurtures life. If one element could define this season of beginnings, it would have to be water. Beneath its sheltering cover, steelhead build their nests. Their long journey from the ocean is over. The rivers of Idaho have called the steelhead back to the place of their birth. Here, the cycle renews itself. The female prepares her nest, fanning the gravel with her tail. Nearby, the male plays court. A moment of time in a dance that has gone on for centuries. Each spring, the waters of Mud Lake nourish thousands of migrating snow geese. The wetland attracts two sandhill cranes pausing on their way to nesting areas further east. Spring comes a bit more slowly to Idaho's high country. Every winter a deadly drama plays out along the river in Island Park. The trumpeter swans depend on the open waters of the Henry's Fork for food. This was a generous winter. The Henry's Fork sustained the flock. The general warmth of spring has come and the swans escape disaster for another year. Bighorns greet the spring ever cautiously, ready to bolt where very few can follow. Life is beginning, cradled in sticks and straw. Spring is the nesting season. As evening closes on Lake Ponderé, this nesting Canada goose comes one day closer to hatching her brood.
The days become longer, stretching into the bright promise of early summer. In time, the warmth of the season even penetrates to the land of towering cliffs and perpetual snows. In this place where nature pushes the elements to the limit, a mysterious creature thrives. The rugged peaks of the Northern Rockies are home to the mountain goat. Only on the top of a mountain do you experience it. Spectacular sunrises pushing tentative fingers of light over the horizon to gently nudge the shoulder of the land, waking it from slumber. Splashes of rosy glow polish the morning sky, reaching into the far off vista of eternity. It seems that in all wild and windswept places, the land is rich with romantic legend. Except here, on the roof of the world, fact and fable become closely intertwined. They appear suddenly and silently, like ancient ghosts, colored in the snowy shades of winter. A shaggy beast, shadowed in mystery, the mountain goat long baffled early explorers. Some thought it a white buffalo, mirroring the muscle hump forequarters and narrow rump of the bison. Lewis and Clark dubbed it another form of mountain sheep, similar to the bighorns they had already encountered on their journey. Captain James Cook, trading pelts with the Indians, concluded that it was the coat of the white bear. They looked to me like they'd been around for millions of years. The, uh, the way they live and where they live, they're just adapted to this kind of habitat. Their habitat is also their defense. Sheer, craggy cliffs stretching skyward to rocky peaks, a home carved from granite. That's where goats live, and this is how they survive. It's their escape cover. Outside of their horns as weapons, they don't have any other way of getting away from predators if something was to go after a mountain lion or a bear. But uh, they can run around in these rocks that no other animal can really get around in. It's early summer, and most of the females have already given birth. Their winter coats hang in long, ragged tatters as they jostle each other for position among the rocks. There's a hierarchy, and there's lots and lots of jostling goes on in the population. And although they are always close together and in groups, there's a certain amount of space around them that they seem to want. As a rule, the females dominate the males, and the rest of the pecking order seems to have a lot to do with the size and age. The lowest spot on the totem pole is reserved for the yearlings last year's offspring. He's at the bottom of the peck order. Probably hasn't been dependent upon his mother since about last October or November. But uh, they're pretty protective of those little guys. During the course of the day, goats from every age group appear. Kids, yearlings, two-year-olds, and adult males and females. This is the sign of a healthy mountain goat population. Goats have never been plentiful because their habitat is limited to areas like this, high, rocky outcrops. Their numbers stay naturally low. In Idaho, there are 39 identified populations of mountain goats. This group on Black Mountain has been here since before the time of Lewis and Clark, but other populations are the result of a transplant program initiated by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Some of them, like the one at Palisades, are, were established by trapping and transplanting to there uh, 25 years ago. And there are several hundred goats there now. It's one of the better populations in the state. They spend a large part of the day pawing, licking, and crunching the deteriorating rock and gravel of the peak, seeking the salt and minerals their bodies require. As the day heats up, the pervasive bugs become intolerable. The goats lead another mountain resident in a dirty dance of rock and roll. Their white coats dulled with dirt, they retreat from the hot midday sun into the shady forest that shelters the remaining snow. And the goats live on those snowbanks. That's where they rest during the day. They get their water there because the, wa the snow is melting and they drink that free water. And that water also produces 
succulent vegetation and they eat the grass that grows. So those snowbanks are extremely important to goats in the summertime. From a distance, they appear to be a large boulder, a snowbank, blending with the environment. Until they move, they're very difficult to see. But set against a bright summer sky, the mountain goat becomes an artist's masterpiece. Classically posed on the edge of a chasm, he appears carved from granite as he surveys the world below. Still a stone, mountain and mountain goat merge. The males lose their coats early, leaving tufts of winter hair suspended in pine branches and trailing on shrubs. Their slicked off bodies disclose enormous shoulder muscles and powerful chests. But the female is slower to shed. This has something to do with the fact that she's nursing a kid and their, her condition is probably not as good as the males. Therefore, her new hair isn't growing as fast and forcing out the old hair. This time of year, it's fairly easy to distinguish between the males and females in a group. Aside from the telltale shaggy coat, the fact that most of the females are nursing has caused their swollen mammary glands to be clearly visible. But in the winter, it can be a very different story. The sex organs are hidden by longer hair, so the only reliable characteristic is a slight difference in the horns. The males are much thicker at the base and sweep up into an arc. The female's horns have less bulk and hook about three inches from the end. Horn and hoof are the mountain goat's security. Few animals have the dexterity to climb the sheer precarious face of a mountain. They have a, a hoof that kind of goes like this and inside of that hoof there's soft pads that grip onto these rocks and they just virtually can go straight up and down, and they do. The heat of the day has passed, and the sun begins to lose its harsh glare. The light softens, slowly retreating to make room for the night. Sharp edges gradually disappear as the mountains blush, bathed in the warm, velvety hues of a hazy dream world. Below, on the steep shale slope, Two small kids use the last of their energy to romp and frolic, heedless of the cliff below. Finally, spent and sleepy, this little fellow surrenders to the night in the safe haven of his mountain home. Summer is like a gift. Each year it can still surprise us with its music. The soft hum of insects, a summer's breeze, and maybe the, the chorus of a mountain bluebird. Perhaps they're a gift too, returning each summer with a bright flash of blue to dazzle our senses and remind us once again that even the smallest creatures evoke a feeling of wonder. Oh, bluebirds are cavity nesters. In the uh, wild, they find abandoned woodpecker holes and other natural cavities. Uh, since uh, there's a shortage of natural cavities, we are able to help the bluebirds and other cavity nesters by putting out man-made nest boxes. It's uh, the same to the bird. It's a cavity with a little hole in it, and it doesn't seem to mind at all. Idaho's state bird, the mountain bluebird, is found statewide. But near the small town of Prairie, you'll see an unusual abundance of these brightly feathered songbirds thanks to the efforts of Al Larson. They call him the Bluebird Man. We've got uh, four baby mountain bluebirds about uh, five days old. Al Larson has been checking bluebird boxes like this every spring and summer for the past 14 years. At this age, I, I just leave them alone. They're uh, kind of small to put a band on. I just count them and record the information on the um, cards here. 
Each of these cards corresponds to one of the 117 bluebird boxes on the route. Al records when each nest is built, tallies the eggs, how many of them hatch, and the number of bluebird young that fledge from the nest. Oh, there's some good sized babies. I'll be able to band these. The boxes are placed about eye level, facing east, so the birds catch the warmth of the early morning sun and are shadowed during the afternoon heat. I can tell you almost exactly how old they are by giving a little measurement here. That's about 49 millimeters. These guys are about 12 days old. Al bands the young to gather a life history on each bird. Through the years, he's discovered that bluebirds tend to return as adults to the same area where they were fledged. And an adult female will return to the same nest box year after year. Now, I like to bring the birds out, usually uh, uh, two at a time or, or more than one, so that they'll feel each other together. And it seems like the sibling contact uh, keeps them quiet. It's quite easy to tell the male from the female in adult birds. The male is bright cobalt blue, shading to a powdery blue on his breast. The female is more gray, with splashes of blue on the tail and main wing feathers or primaries. But with the young, it's a bit more difficult. I just notice the difference in color on here. The female is in my right hand and the male is in the left. You can uh, notice the, the blue developing in the young ones, oh, what about 12 days old. Soon after the young are banded and placed back into the nest, the adults return to feed their offspring. The nestlings receive mostly insects, flies, um, mosquitoes, uh, worms, grubs, caterpillars, things like that. They're a very beneficial bird from man's point of view. Al has become the resident expert on mountain bluebirds, spending long hours just watching the birds go about their business. For this gentle man, there can be no better pastime. I guess uh, I like bluebirds uh, to work with bluebirds because they, they accept me, they accept people probably more than a lot of the other songbirds do. They are in need of help uh, for their nesting spots and, and I can help them. It just seems like I'm reaching out and helping somebody in need. I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Well, we go on to the next one and see what's in there. This is like Christmas time, you know, you open the packages and you wonder what's going to be inside. The adult birds can actually bring off two sets of young each year, with five to six eggs in each clutch. A little simple arithmetic demonstrates why Al Larson is known as the Bluebird Man. Fourteen years of banding these nestlings has him handling well over 5,000 bluebirds. I have no uh, financial backing on it, and I receive nothing out of it but uh, the joy of working with the birds. Al hopes someday to combine all his note cards and years of observations into a book on bluebirds. But perhaps that would steal time away from what he really loves. I just like to sit there and observe them and watch their family life. I think it, uh, it helps a person realize his place in life if he uh, gets close to these birds, other wildlife, and see how they live. And if you help them out, then you have a more direct part in it. Somehow, summer seems to blend into fall so perfectly, we hardly notice it happening. Suddenly, one day, we realize that the vibrant palette of autumn is already around us. It's a sign of nature's subtle artistry. When we mix pictures and music in our stories, we try to keep the blend as subtle as nature's. But composing music to match the beauty and magnificence of Idaho requires an artist. His palette is made up of French horns, pianos, and violins. His canvas is a symphony. You're already familiar with his work. He is the talented Kevin Kirk, who's composed the powerful introductory music for our incredible Idaho show. I try to uh, empty everything out of my mind and just 
imagine what it would sound like, imagine the sounds that it would make. I remember reading one time that someone described architecture as frozen music, and uh, the architecture of, of the city of rocks is so complicated and intricate that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of thaw out some of those notes. It, there's just so much here. There's so much variety, and there's so many different ways you could approach it. He seems to hear with his eyes. Faced with this magnificent panorama, the artist in all of us yearns to capture it somehow. But watching Kevin Kirk at work is a unique experience. You can almost see the breathtaking vista flow from Kevin's vision to his unerring fingers, and music is born. I'm trying to capture somehow the um, soft, round shapes of the granite right next to really angular, geometric shapes. They fit together so well, and it's such a dichotomy. For a time, Kevin's musical career took him away from the Idaho of his childhood, but the pull to return proved impossible to resist. Idaho is, is a playground. It's a Disneyland of, of inspiration. It's so diverse. It's so untouched. There's a peace to this place, a quiet that nurtures introspection and fosters creativity. I think what I'm picking up on here is just, you know, a grand architect, just an amazingly sophisticated uh, balance of structures that, that are really inspiring. The forces that originally flowed to form this hidden refuge now seem to invite Kevin to fill the quiet chamber with the echoes of his soul. The function of music at its best is that it tells a story, it invites you in to the place that the story is about. That's difficult to do, but I, I love it. On location, a modest keyboard captures and records Kevin's inspiration. But the delicate task of refining the music requires more sophisticated equipment. In this small studio, an entire symphony orchestra awaits. Violins, cellos, French horns, flutes, all are flawlessly captured and digitally recorded in a computer. At Kevin's touch, it comes to life. So I'll reach over to the mouse and click on the main thing. I'm going to try to add another instrument to that, all of which I, I add from this keyboard. There's my wind. And this entire process is, is uh, very involved. Uh, it's important not to put too much, to add too much. Uh, I just want enough to tell the story. I feel that, that music is, is uh, almost a miraculous thing in life. Uh, it's, it's like a language. I've even debated in my mind if, if you uh, wanted to think what God's language would be. Maybe he would speak in music. Now, a harmony of sight and sound. The mysterious images of Idaho's city of rocks set to the sound of Kevin Kirk's original music.
autumn. Even the word seems to carry the fragrance of wood smoke. I'm not sure which I enjoy more, the, the crisp golden afternoons fishing the rivers or maybe an evening in front of a fire reading a good book. Norman McLean's A River Runs Through It is a favorite of mine. He seems to capture the humor, the frustration, the, the peace and the occasional obsessive nature of fly fishing. He writes of his father, a Presbyterian minister and a dedicated fly fisherman. My father was very sure about certain matters pertaining to the universe. To him, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. Neither do big steelhead trout in Idaho. There's a certain mystique about steelhead fishing that probably isn't there for fishing for brown or rainbow trout, for instance. I think there's a little more of an art to it. There's certainly a lot of rarer fish, so it's um, the opportunity to catch one and the chance of catching one is a lot smaller, and that certainly increases the attraction uh, to catch a, a fish of that kind of size. Native steelhead returned to Idaho in the fall after one to three years spent in the ocean feeding. The big trout winter in places like the Snake River near Lewiston, living off fat reserves until spring when they move up the tributaries to their spawning grounds. But in the meantime, they encounter the gauntlet of anglers coming to Idaho from all over the country with steelhead fever. This is the, one of the premier places in North America for a steelhead, one of North America's premier large trout. I'm going to see if I can find some. Colorado angler George Jensen's chances of finding one are much improved over last year. At last count, the number of steelhead crossing Lower Granite Dam was 85,000, twice the number of last year's run. But even the best trout fishermen may need to modify his technique to land a steelhead. Trout fishermen, you know, fish with logic, or at least they think they fish with logic, and they're thinking about what the fish is feeding on, everything like that. And when you're dealing with steelhead, you're dealing with uh, a fish that hasn't really fed actively since it left the ocean. A good fishing guide can give you an edge. John Patterson and his partner, John Crawford, have 14 years of steelhead experience between them, fishing with everything from spoons to spinners. But one of the most challenging ways to catch a steelhead is with a fly. You know, you have to pay attention all the time. Every cast has to be accurate, has to be controlled, you know, and you need to do the, the very best you can with it to try to stay right on top of it. Fish! <laughs> He's a hot little bugger. You know that it isn't something else. <laughs> it, it's solid. It's really, you know, and you feel, you feel real weight for a second. There's sort of a little hesitation. And uh, depending on the fish, the hot fish will really take off then. I couldn't believe it. I just, I only put out about a 30-foot cast. They just took it right in the swing. <laughs> well, this fish might go 26 inches. Not quite a 40-incher. Well, he's <laughs> definitely a hatchery fish and got the dorsal down on him and got the ad fin clipped off of him for sure. A missing adipose fin means that it's not a wild fish, but was raised in one of Idaho's four steelhead hatcheries. As a smolt, its adipose was clipped before it was sent on its long journey to the ocean. If this were a wild steelhead, it would be catch and release only. Well, it's about a 25, 26-inch fish, a little female. And she's been through some tough times one way or the other, but she made it this far. <laughs> oh, that was fun. The very first line of the story, A River Runs Through It, reads, In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. Perhaps that explains better than anything what fishing does for the soul. Hey, what do you want him to put on your tombstone? <laughs> that he stayed home and worked or that he went steelhead fishing? <laughs> Well, how about that he caught a steelhead? I don't think that's even as important as the fishing itself. I think when you get hung up on the catching a, a fish, you lose a great deal of why you're there. I love fishing in the fall. And to me, this is the best time of year. I mean, look at the scenery that we have around us. The weather is perfect. Not that many people out. It's, it's just a neat time of year. This is absolutely fabulous. 
there's nothing like it. Colorado's got, got its own qualities, but Idaho has its own unique flavor, scenery, people, and fish. Early winter brings the first soft dustings of snow to Idaho's high country. It's the holiday season, the season for giving. From North Dakota to Idaho, a transplant of wild turkeys to supplement our resident flock. And Idaho's gift, bighorn sheep from the Owyhee desert country. There are words we associate with the desert, barren, forsaken, desolate, forbidding. There's an eeriness to this place that haunts our imagination. Maybe it's the incredible silence, the utter stillness except for the wind. Maybe it's the ghosts, the shredded skeletons of abandoned towns clinging forlornly to the slopes of the Owyhee Mountains. Maybe it's just the peace. It seems a graveyard, a place of death. But the muted colors of the desert camouflage a world teeming with life. Rabbit, coyote, antelope, deer, and bighorn sheep. Well, it's tremendous country. I hope that Idaho citizens realize what they've got out here. This is a real unique area. Uh, those steep canyons, uh, totally unlike anything we've got in North Dakota, uh, appear to be excellent sheep habitat, and I think that's borne out by the, by the reproductive success of the sheep herd out here. The Owyhee bighorn herd is the only available source in the country for a wild sheep transplant operation like this. But it wasn't always the healthy herd it is today. The influx of miners, domestic livestock, and disease late in the 19th century decimated the original bighorn population. The last known bighorn in Owyhee County was killed east of Battle Creek in 1927. But today, this same area is the focal point of the transplant operation. In 1963, the department uh, brought a dozen sheep down here and released them in uh, the East Fork of the Waihee River drainage. And then in 1965, they brought a few more in. And over the next five, six years, between here and Little Jack's Creek, uh, there was about 37 sheep transplanted in this drainage. There were none here at that time. Today, 28 years later, biologists estimate that the bighorn population has exploded from the original 37 transplants to 1,200 wild sheep roaming the Owyhee Desert. I'd say 30, 30 animals in a group. Two Jet Ranger helicopters are used for the capture operation. The front helicopter is the gunning ship. This one carries the pilot, a spotter, the gunner, and the net gun, a device specifically designed for wild animal captures. The capture gun shoots a 12-foot square net with weights attached to each corner. The gunner chooses a sheep in the running herd and then aims for the animal's shoulders. Good job, good job. The uh, pilot's the one that really does most of the work to get them in a position that, uh, that we can get a good shot at them. Basically, you're just going to see the sheep jump into the net and then ball up on the ground. It's a lot less stressful on the animal than if they're um, not tangled very well and are able to struggle quite a bit. The second helicopter carries three muggers. Once the animal is tangled in the net, it hovers low enough for the mugging team to jump out with tools of their trade, blindfolds and hobbles. They tend to overheat um, when they struggle a lot. Uh, we always carry water bottles with our mugging equipment so that we can keep the animals cool, basically to get them hobbled and in those bags and uh, back to the base camp just as quickly as we can. The North Dakota crew waits at base camp, ready to administer blood tests and attach radio collars and ear tags. Ten base uh, helicopter one is inbound with uh, two sheep. Now ten four, what's your ETA? Looks like about uh, ten minutes. An opportunity like this is a dream come true for us, where Idaho allows us to come down and get some sheep. In North Dakota, there's there's a very romantic sentiment about the fact that we had the the Audubon bighorns at the turn of the century. And now we've got bighorns back, and there's a lot of people in the state, and they may never see a sheep in the Badlands, but the fact that they're out there and that they know they're out there is enough for them. The Owyhee Desert, barren, forsaken, desolate, forbidding. Maybe we need new words. Spectacular. 
awe-inspiring, vast and magical. Maybe we need to preserve rather than abandon. If we lose this habitat, the sheep go with it and a lot of other things that are out there. Midwinter found me taking off for warmer climbs to fly fish, but that doesn't mean there isn't some great ice fishing to be found right here in Idaho. While I was gone, my daughter, Margot Hemingway, found a corner of the state where a strange ritual takes place. Growing up in the Hemingway family, you can be sure that fly fishing was a required part of our education. And so are my dad's fish stories. But of all the fish tales that I've heard, and there have been a lot, None quite compares to the stories that come out of Bear Lake each January. The shores of Bear Lake once echoed with the shouts of mountain men as they gathered for the trapper rendezvous of 1827 and 1828. This country saw the first Mormon pioneers struggling to scratch a living from the land. And it concealed the nervous Butch Cassidy and his wild bunch the night before their very first bank heist. But perhaps none of these characters are quite as colorful as the folks who, each January, brave an icy, dark winter morning to go Cisco dipping. For two weeks every January, they're running. This small, smelt-like whitefish is one of the five species that are found only in Bear Lake. It's spawning time for the Bonneville Cisco, and there's probably four to five million of them in the lake. Give or take a few. Three, twenty-four, Jim. How many can we get six more? Six more. I mean, the idea that you can look down in the hole and see these fish swimming around and then be able to, to legally run down there and dip them out, it's like every poacher's dream. Holy cow, look at them in there. Sort of brings out the strange desires in people. Cisco fishing has its own kind of fashion. Well, I get carried away sometimes and get my hands in the water. What brings you out here at five in the morning on a cold winter day? Adventure. Challenge. So your wife can say you're crazy and you can confirm it each year. Techniques vary, and so do the reasons for coming here. It's the most exciting thing that happens on Bear Lake. Oh, I love it. This is like a picnic. <laughs> well, I think you just got there it. They are. There, they are. there you go. <laughs> Have you guys been doing this a lot of years? Oh, something like about 15, 20. I've been doing that all my life. Here. Look right down there and you can take a picture of them down there in that yeah, hole. Right down in the bottom <laughs> of the hole. Look, see them all down there? See them all down there? And then there are the rookies. Have you done this before? Nope, this is the first time I've ever seen them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> In fact, that's the first time I've ever seen a Cisco. Yeah. Sure are cute little fellas, aren't they? They are. <laughs> Look at that scoop, Gerald. <laughs> I've never done it before, and I really enjoy myself. So how did you get all these guys to do this? I missed him, didn't I? Yeah. I tied him up and put him in the back of the pick and brought him down. <laughs> no, I told them about it. And they believed you? They believed me. What did you tell them? Well, you know, they're just like everything else. Everybody knows every fisherman's a liar, and so they just wanted to see how bad a one I was. <laughs> what do you think, you guys? 51. <laughs> what kind of liar is he? Is he a good liar? He's a, he's a good liar, really. <laughs> you going to do this again? Sure, sure. <laughs> ah, I did got one. Yes, you did. <laughs> At least I won't be completely skunked again. The limit for each angler is 30 Cisco. And if in all the excitement you have trouble counting your fish, you can always call on Tuffy the Wonder Dog. Boy, I got a, I got a smart dog. Your dog counts the fish? You bet. He counts every one of them. Go ahead, tell him about that dog. What do you do? They wouldn't believe me. He says he Count. counts fish. He, well, you count every fish in that bucket. Bark each time for each fish. All right. Everybody knows that dog. A lot of people use the fish for, for food. They're kind of like smelt, but uh, probably a, a large part of people also use them for bait because the, the Cisco is the main forage fish for uh, Bear Lake cutthroat. Had the most fantastic uh, cutthroat fish in the middle of December you ever seen. We got our limit of Cisco, and anyway, and then we cut the little tails off, and and then we put them on a cast master. <laughs> we just <laughs> hope a big one comes by. Oh, 
an experience and a half. But no matter what you use them for or whatever your age, there's nothing like Bear Lake Cisco Run. To the side of you, bud. I just got oh, Craig. Oh, all right. That's, That's it. What we need. I got lots of them right there. Show me how many you got in that bucket. Well, I, we had 75, and I caught a few. Caught some of them, and it, it was really fun. Although Cisco seem to flourish beneath the ice in Bear Lake, winter is a critical time for most Idaho wildlife. The harsh Rocky Mountain winter drives deer, elk, and moose down to lower elevations that are more forgiving. As we close the best of incredible Idaho, we'll take you to an area near Idaho Falls called Tex Creek, where wildlife has found a winter home.